Uh, okay, so here's a story. Yesterday morning, which won't actually be yesterday by the time I post this, I was busy working on a script regarding some claims made by controversial YouTuber Riley J. Dennis. Later on that day, I found myself watching a variety of response videos to a YouTuber who goes by the name of Sean. Mostly, these were responses being made by literal racists in response to Sean's various anti-racist videos. Unsurprisingly, the responses were less than convincing, and I found myself thinking, say what you will about Sean, but he's quite unstoppable. He very effectively dismantles the claims of reactionaries, and I certainly wouldn't want the job of having to respond to him. And of course, there's no real reason why I ever would need to respond to Sean. As far as his YouTube content goes, we agree on absolutely everything. We agree that the monarchy should be abolished, and the rail network should be renationalized, and the racists and uh, that racists and anti-feminists are bad. I have my issues with Sean as a person, which I'll briefly touch on later, but his YouTube content is generally pretty great at proving progressive causes correct. But then I get home, log on to my computer, and what do I see? A video by Sean talking about transphobia in the UK. This is the first time that I would ever disagree with Sean's content. This would be the first time that Sean would ever make a video addressing me and my position. So I watched intensely, and yeah, I think I can just about manage a response. Before I begin, I should just make a few things clear. Firstly, by acknowledging that a video about transphobia in the UK is about me, I am implicitly identifying myself as a transphobe. Now, to clarify a point, I'm not a transphobe. I have no problem with somebody's decision to be trans. I reckon trans people are every bit as decent as the average person. In fact, I am cool to love trans people unconditionally. So yeah, not a transphobe, not transphobic. But I know that Sean would consider me a transphobe because I believe that womanhood is a socially constructed label based on biology, not feelings. Now, secondly, it's worth noting that I am quite new to this whole not towing the transgender identity politics line thing. In the video I was scripting on Riley J. Dennis, I actually gave a brief account of exactly how I went from calling gender critical feminists Nazis in the comments section of this ContraPoints video to being me now making this video. Since I can't be bothered to redraft everything, you'll just have to wait for that video to come out. Finally, might be a bit of a while before that video comes out because I don't really want to release two videos on the trans identity politics issue in a row. This is not and never will be a channel about that. This is a channel about all sorts of issues, and I can pretty much promise you that you will vehemently disagree with me on at least one of my opinions expressed on this channel. But if you're up for that, if you're up for that, please do subscribe, or at least keep watching. Oh, and also, I know Sean does that thing where he encourages people to watch the videos he's responding to because civility politics, I guess. I'm not going to encourage you to watch Sean's video for a very specific reason, which I'll get into at the end of this response. But speaking of civility politics, one final final thing I should mention is I'm going to try and avoid identifying transgender people with penises as men, because I'm aware that in doing so, I would be implicitly framing this discussion in my favor, which is not a good approach to honest discussion. Anyway, let's look at Sean's video. Surely the Guardian can be counted on to stand up for minority rights, a wrong person might say. So first of all, Sean starts off with this rather reductionist formulation of the Guardian's position. Trans people are a minority. They want the right to access women's private spaces. The Guardian is hesitant to support this. Therefore, the Guardian cannot be counted on to stand up for minority rights. This frames the Guardian at worst as being reactionary on all counts, and at best as being inconsistent when it comes to transgender people. Since I don't think Sean would argue that the Guardian consistently fails to stand up for minority rights, it's safe to assume he's framing The Guardian as being inconsistent. But notice how this dishonestly frames the discussion to be automatically against gender critical people. You see, when somebody who is consistently in support of minority rights and generally active in progressive causes suddenly appears to become reactionary on an issue, there are two ways you can interpret that. You can say that there must be some kind of blind spot that fosters this hypocrisy. Progressive voices are totally down for progressivism when it comes to sexuality, race, and gender, but when it comes to gender identity, they suddenly seem not so keen. There must be some kind of explanation for this. Perhaps it's that so-called progressives just really, really, really hate trans people. The alternative is you think, wow, that's strange. An individual or group of people who agree with me on pretty much everything suddenly disagree with me when it comes to transgender identity politics. I wonder why. Perhaps there's a reason. I'm personally an advocate for taking the latter approach. I find that it helps you to better understand where people are coming from. I try to always approach things 
with the mentality that if something seems bizarre or inconsistent or hypocritical to me, it must be because I have misunderstood something. I pride myself on taking that approach. Having said that, it was taking that approach that caused me to become gender critical myself, so be wary of that. Given all of this, it's no surprise that under Sean's framing, being critical of any aspect of transgender identity politics becomes not standing up for minorities' rights. So we're off to a good start. Consider an article that discussing desegregation, say, made the case that white people's concerns about sharing spaces with black people must be taken seriously. Okay, so first of all, in this analogy, Sean casts women with vaginas, a group of people that have been subject to consistent societal discrimination for millennia in every culture on the planet as segregation era white people, while in contrast, ooh, let's not part my headphones, <laughs> while in contrast, Sean casts people with penises as black people under Jim Crow laws. Yes, Sean. Women are just like a race of people that use their societal and political hegemony to systemically oppress another group of people. Great analogy. And this is when we get a problem, because if you switch it around so that they are oppressed and other oppressed groups actually lining up, then you have women with vaginas would be analogous to black people. Meanwhile, you have people with penises would be analogous to white people. Within this analogy, then, there would be a group of white people who want to be considered black people. They want to be let into black people's spaces and be considered part of the subject of black empowerment movements. They also want to remove references to skin colour within black empowerment language because they feel it is exclusionary to black people who were born with less pigmentation. Now, all I have done here is taken Sean's analogy and actually switched it around so that the oppressed groups actually line up and we've created a problem. Because actually, I think many people would agree that it's perfectly reasonable for black people to object to allowing transracial people into their private spaces. So let's just break this down. Societal, cultural, and political institutions reserved for white people are immoral because white people have been historically oppressive beneficiaries of racism, while societal, cultural, and political institutions reserved for black people are perfectly moral because black people have been historically oppressed and disadvantaged by racism. The same can be said for gender, and if you attempt to define gender in such a way that people with penises are able to enter into spaces reserved for women, it's not surprising, and certainly is not bigoted, that many women would have a problem with that. I would also point out that Sean is not arguing that there shouldn't be gender segregation. He isn't arguing that women and men shouldn't have their own separate spaces. Instead, he's simply saying, that people should be able to declare themselves as belonging to a particular gender, and in doing so, gain access to such separate places. You see, going to the toilet is a very vulnerable position for a lot of people. It's the most exposed one will typically get in public. A public toilet is a room where multiple people all have their genitals out at once. At the same time, a large chunk of men's oppression of women has been sexual. And given that it's been sexual, it's often involved genitals. In other words, when women object to penises in their safe spaces, they are objecting to a key instrument of sexist oppression. Comparing this with, comparing this, comparing this with the concerns of white women that black men might sexually assault them, the particular concern over black men can only be due to racism. After all, black men haven't got anything white men don't have. They both have the same instrument of sexist oppression. So the only basis for being especially concerned over black men is because of racist notions. Finally, there is a bit in Susan Brown Miller's book, Our Bodies, Ourselves. Is that actually... I feel like I'm lying there. Is that what the book's called? Let me check. No. I redrafted this once, but that's more than I redraft most things, and I, I got the title of the book wrong. Um, so obviously it's actually uh, Against Our Will. I don't know if that's going to appear um, mirrored, but uh, it's Against Our Will, Men, Women, and Rape by Susan Brown Miller. Um, and it happens to be just got the section that I wanted, so I can read it. 
fuck? You know what I just did? I'm such an idiot. Okay. Let's try it again. Uh, ah. Nope, we're in the wrong place. What a disaster. I'm writing a book on rape, I told a librarian. You wouldn't by any chance have any special files. He looked acutely unhappy. I was soon to learn that no library in the world has efficiently catalogued rape material, but that wasn't the cause of this librarian's discomfort. Why did you come here? He asked with caution. Because I thought this would be the best place to find historical stuff on the rape of black women. I'm writing a serious book. Then you mean to ask about the lynching of black men. Sir? I know about that, I answered, and I know where to find the material when I'm ready for it. At this point, I really need to know about the rape of black women. I'm sorry, young lady. If you're serious about your subject, you need to start with the historic injustice to black men. That must be your approach. That has been your approach, sir. I'm interested in the historic injustice to women. To black people, rape has meant the lynching of the black man, he said, with his voice rising. And it continues for a bit. Put that back. I uh, got some books for Christmas. I got um, Men Among the Ruins, Post-War Reflections of a Radical Traditionist by Julius Avola. People will like that. Um, Britain in Iraq, Contriving King and Country by Peter Sluglet. The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. Uh, and this one, like, I've been saying this for ages, and I've been like, I need to get it. Um, it's Karen Elliott House on Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Impossible Revolution, Making Sense of the Syrian Tragedy by Yassin Al-Hajj Saleh. Fox's Book of Martyrs. I got this. I thought... Um, Poems That Make Grown Men Cry. This is an interesting book. It, it hasn't made me cry yet. It's basically a list of poems by famous men talking about poems that have made them cry. Because it's, it's okay for men to cry. Um, Iraq Since 1958, From Revolution to Dictatorship by I.B. Taurus. Now, I.B. Taurus um, wrote another book that I read for my dissertation, which was on Yemen, um, I think. And The Forever War by Dexter Filkins, which is about the American War on Terror. <sighs> Why did that happen? I don't know. I got distracted. Okay. I actually did get some other books. That's the worst thing, but I'm not going to go through those. Uh, the basic takeaway from this story is that oftentimes the racist dimension to black men being accused of sexual assault by white women in the U.S. South has been used to undermine women's contemporary concerns about sexual assault. And we have an example of that in action right here. You're concerned about having your own private spaces in your, in your bathroom? Well, you sound just like those racist white women who are responsible for black men being lynched. Uh, firstly, I'm a cis man, and I am by no means an expert on trans issues or anything else, actually, and nor am I trying to present myself as such. If I know anything at all, it's from listening to trans people, reading the things they've written, watching videos they've made, and talking to my trans friends, uh, some of whom helped me write this video, actually. Likewise, if I know anything, it's from listening and talking to women. You may have heard of them, sure. They make up 50% of the population. They have been the most consistent victims of societal discrimination ever. You see, remember when there was a bit of a thing in the feminist movement about listening to women and believing them? The phrase even has its own Know Your Meme page dedicated to it. See, I took that phrase a little too literally, it seems. You see, what I started to do was listen to women uh, about the topics where they didn't actually agree with me, and I tried to see their reasoning and understand their experiences. You see, I was a white middle-class person with a penis who was attracted to women, living in a comfortable lib fam he-for-she bubble with the soothing voice of Emma Watson comforting me. One day, I thought that maybe as part of being a self-professed feminist, I should listen to women. I should read what they have to say. I should watch their videos. It turned out there are all sorts of women out there, black women, lesbian women, working class women, old women. And I heard these women say something that shocked me. They have a problem with transgender identity politics. 
You see, before I was a white middle-class person with a penis who was attracted to women living in a comfortable lib fem heath she bubble, I was a white middle-class person with a penis who was attracted to women living in a comfortable anti-feminist hashtag free Sargon bubble. I believed that women didn't have any problems and sexism was over. However, I started listening to women and learning about their experiences, and I had my worldview challenged dramatically. Now, I could have done what a lot of dickheads do, which is call those women a mean name, accuse them of hating men, and ignored their experiences as bigoted overreactions. But instead, I listened, and I believed, and now I'm a feminist. So when I heard that a lot of women have a problem with trans identity politics, again, my worldview was challenged dramatically. I could have done what a lot of dickheads do, which is call those women a mean name, accuse them of hating trans people, and ignore their experiences as bigoted overreactions. But instead, I listened and believed, and now I'm gender critical. It was only later on that I found out that, rather foolishly, I listened and believed the wrong women. How silly of me. Now, Sean acts as if he's checking his privilege at the door here. He is a privileged cishet man, but don't worry, he's listening to the views of the marginalized voices. Except when you break it down, you have Sean, who is a white, probably middle class person with a penis, who is probably attracted to women, speaking to a load of probably white, probably middle class people with penises who are probably attracted to women. Maybe some of them were black, or some of them were attracted to men, or some of them were working class, but I'm betting a lot of them fit the above description. So Sean has checked his privilege here by talking to people who tick a heck of a lot of the privilege boxes themselves. In fact, the only thing that makes these people oppressed at all is that they claim to belong to a marginalized group, women. Also, it's funny to me that Sean had trans people to help him write this video. Whenever he talks about race, it's fine. He's a white guy, but he can talk about race all day. Whenever he talks about misogyny, it's fine. He's a man, but he can talk about misogyny all day. However, now that he's talking about trans people, he needs to call in the inclusivity cavalry. That's good. It's good that in your video where you slander gender-critical feminists, you don't do anything to misrepresent trans people. It's kind of funny, and by funny I mean sad, that modern feminism is a bunch of guys talking about women's issues without much inclusion from actual women, However, when they talk about people with penises, it's important that they allow the voices of such people to be heard. And before anyone says, but hey, you're being a hypocrite. You're talking about women's issues and you're a man. That's true. But I don't pretend to be anything else. I have a penis. I'm a man. I'm a part of an oppressive class. I have internalized misogyny. If I say anything right, it's ultimately due to the privilege I have as somebody who has the money to afford all these books and the free time to read them, not to mention the privilege I have as somebody who can express their opinion online without having to worry about the harassment women are regularly subject to. I'm getting annoyed doing this. Uh, Speaking for myself here, but genitals tend not to come into play in the majority of my interactions with other people day to day. It's an inconsequential unknown quantity. What genitals you have is an inconsequential unknown quantity. What a horrendous insult to the billions of women throughout human history who have been subject to unimaginable discrimination because of that inconsequential unknown quantity. I feel like up until this point, I've had quite long responses to Sean's points, but I'm really not sure what else needs to be said here. Women is a socially constructed term used to refer firstly to those who have experienced the oppression that comes with having been born with a vagina. And yes, Sean, shockingly, Some people have experienced oppression due to being born of a vagina. Really didn't think that would need to be news to a self-proclaimed feminist, but apparently somebody's genitals is an inconsequential unknown quantity. Secondly, women is a socially constructed term used to refer to those who experience the biological phenomenon of being a woman. Male bodies and female bodies are different, and the interaction between you and your body will define you as a person. This is similar to how black is a socially constructed term used to refer to people with darker skin pigmentation, typically from Africa originally, but also from Oceania. More importantly though, it is used to refer to the shared experience of people who have experienced having a dark skin in a world where systemic racial oppression and a global white hegemony exist. Now sure, you can reject this definition, but if you're going to reject it, it has to be for a better reason than Outside of the person in question, their parents, and their doctors, not many other people day to day are gonna know what genitals someone was born with. This is anti-feminist levels of ridiculousness. 
Have you ever been personally oppressed by somebody checking what genitals you have and then harassing you based on that? No. Well, in that case, sexism doesn't real. Right. He mentions parents here as if it's an irrelevance. Oh yeah, nobody knows what kind of genital you have, except for the people who raise you and oversee the vast majority of your formative years. Your genitals determine much of your formative years. They determine whom you hang out with, what you're expected to like, how you're supposed to process your emotions, and to which gender you're supposed to be attracted. Now yes, some people go against these social pressures. Gays and lesbians exist. Some people even go against these social pressures by processing emotions differently, dressing differently, and liking things stereotypically associated with the other gender. These people have been so indoctrinated into the gender system that they conclude from this that they must in fact be an actual member of the other gender. Imagine that. So yeah, what genitals you have matters. It matters so much that people will have their genitals surgically removed because they believe that their genitals don't match their feelings. Given all of this, to suggest that there isn't a big difference between people socialized as children with vaginas and people socialized as children with penises is just so immeasurably wrong. It is largely a socially constructed difference that gender critical people are opposed to. In reality, the only non-socially constructed differences are entirely biological. 